hey, today I want to talk to you a little bit about relationships. Jesus said the biggest thing in life is that we love God with our whole self. He was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God with your whole self. And then he said, the second commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is saying life is all about relationships. We'll be talking about this quite a bit uh, later in the fall. But it's about our relationship with God and then our relationship with God people. And so I want to talk to you today a little bit about friendship. And I want to talk to you today about how, what would it look like if you became the kind of friend that you wish you had? And friendship can be difficult. And I've actually read quite a bit about that. They say that friendship actually gets a little bit harder the older you get. In fact, um, I was reading someplace where where it was talking about how if if you're between the ages of 16 and 22, if you're an average person, you will peak at your number of good friends around that time in your life, between uh, high school and college. And it's easy to understand why, because you don't have much else to do, right? I remember being in college and just hanging out with guys late into the night. No one had a whole lot of responsibility. You're just connecting. You've got nothing else to do but just have these great friendships. But as life goes on, things get complicated. Some of your great friends move away. And then people start to get married, which adds a whole other complication to relationships because it's no longer you just have to find one person that you enjoy being around. Now, if it's going to be a couple friend, you and the wife have to find another guy and his wife that you, you know, a lot of times it's like, I like the guy, but she doesn't like the lady or vice versa. Not Claire, the imaginary Claire, right? And so uh, um, it's... uh, you know, and then it goes to another level when you start having kids, right? You, if you want the families to hang out, you find some kids around the same age, and, and then you find some people, like, like the guy's great, the lady's great, and it's like the kids are around the same age, but their kid is like a black belt in jujitsu, and your kid's a mama's boy, always coming back beaten up, and it's like, gosh, it's just so hard to find some people to hang out with, right? And, and then you get so busy with work, and, and it can be really, really hard. And so I want to talk to you today uh, about how to, what if you became the friend that you wish you had? That's what the Bible says to do. In Proverbs chapter 18, 24, the Bible says that if you, I'm going to read to you, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. It's like, hey, if you want to have great friendships, you become a great friend. Uh, A man that has friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Here's how Zig Ziglar said it. He said, if you go looking for a friend, you're going to find that they're scarce. If you go out to be a friend, you'll find them everywhere. Really, the key in life is for you to become the kind of friend you wish you had. And and so I want us to look today at a, a guy in the book of Acts. And I believe it's one of the best examples of friendship we see in the whole Bible. So if you have your Bibles, go over to Acts chapter 9. Best cheer of the day, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. So here's the context, right? There's this guy named Saul. We're introduced to Saul. Um, as uh, there's, this, there's this guy named Stephen who loves Jesus. He's preaching. And there's this guy named Saul who uh, kind of gathers up a posse to kill Stephen for preaching about Jesus. And so they're throwing rocks at Stephen. Stephen ends up dying for preaching about Jesus. That's our introdu- introduction to Saul, right? Well, then the next thing that happens is Saul is on this road, and Jesus appears to him. And then Saul becomes a follower of Jesus, but all the Christians think it's a trick. They think he's just pretending to be one of us so he can, during our prayer meeting, he can just kill us. That's what they think is going to happen. And so that's where we catch up with this story and we're introduced to this guy, Barnabas. Acts chapter 9 and verse 26, it says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. They thought it was a fake deal. And so but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Here's the first thing. If you're going to become the kind of friend you wish you had, you got to try. Great friendships almost never happen on accident. And so what we see here with Barnabas is is that he takes the time, he takes the effort, and he takes the risk. 
He goes to Saul. He, he stops what he's doing. He stops everything else in his life. He goes to him, and then he takes the time to bring him back to the rest of the apostles, and then he vouches for him. He says, hey, this guy's the real deal. Hey, there's no reason to be afraid. Everyone else was afraid. Every, but, but Barnabas takes the risk. And, and I believe that, that some of the greatest barriers to us having the relationships, whether that's our relationship with our spouse or our relationship with our kids or our relationship with our friends, is, is a lot of times it comes down to one of these three things. Either I'm not willing to take the time, I'm not willing to take the effort, or I'm not willing to take the risk. And, and, and I'm going to talk about that for a minute. So for you, which one of those three? If you were to say, hey, the barrier to my relationships being all that they could be, which one of these three presents the biggest barrier for you? And I think it's easy for us to go to the time thing. Oh, I would be a better friend. I'd be a better husband. I'd be a better dad if I just had more time. But what we have to own is that that is never the real deal, right? We all have the same amount of time. It's a matter of what do I choose to do with it? Really, the issue is my priorities. What matters most to me? No one is making you work 70 hours a week at your job. No one's making you stay at that job. You're, you're not an indentured servant. You have the right to quit your job tomorrow. You say, well, then I'll have a smaller house if I don't. Yes, you're choosing to work 70 hours a week so you can have the, the, this dream house that it probably isn't even that great, you know. <laughs> it's just a house. But you're, no one's making you stay there. No one's making you have your kid in five different sports, right? That's right. They're never going to play in the NBA. <laughs> Unless you're Dave, one of Dave's kids. It's like two families at Life Church that have any business hoping for scholarships from their kids in sports, right? I've seen all your kids. And um, I've seen the gene pool they come from. And uh, it's a choice, right? There's no one making you do that. And so you say, I don't have time to take my wife on a date. I don't have time to invest in these friendships. What really you're saying, and it's just a freeing to own it, is I'm not willing to make the choices to have that time. It doesn't matter enough to me. Right. And so the, the time thing, and then there's the effort thing. Friendships that go beyond the surface level require some effort. And sometimes it requires some awkward conversations. Sometimes it requires working through some difficulty. Sometimes it requires taking the effort and to say, hey, when you said this, it kind of made me feel this way, kind of hurt me. And then talking through it and clearing up the misunderstanding and, and, and owning the awkwardness, it takes effort. And then it takes risk. In this situation, nobody was willing to take the risk to be Saul's friend except for Barnabas. Everyone else thought that the guy was just going to kill him. And that's not the kind of risk we're talking about in relationships. So it's many times what keeps us from having the relationships we were created to have is this fear and this risk. It might be a risk of fear of rejection. Well, hey, if I take the first move and say, hey, do you guys want to come over and eat some food and watch a ball game or whatever, maybe they're going to say no. It's the fear of rejection. Maybe for some of you it's, and I think all of us connect to this at some level, it's the fear of, of if I let them close, then they'll be close enough to hurt me. You've experienced that before where you let someone come close and then they really hurt you. And, and there could be the fear of that. Then there can be the fear of if they really know me, if they get to know me better and know the real me, then, then they'll see my crazy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if they know the real me, will they even really like me? The other day, Claire and I are having lunch with these people at Life Church, people that we've said hello to half a dozen times. Hey, how's it going? We're having lunch with these people to get to know them better. And uh, we're having lunch, and, and, uh, and, and there's this thing that I've had this anxiety about, this angst about, um, that I believed myself to have released my angst. Like, oh, I've gotten over that. It's no longer a thing for me. I, that's no longer stresses me out, right? You ever had a thing where you think, like, I've, I've gotten over this. I've matured past this. I've released this. I've given this to Jesus. And uh, so then this topic comes up in our lunch, Right? And I, like, feel this visceral reaction that I am incapable of hiding from these virtual strangers. <laughs> and I'm like, I just wanted to have lunch. <laughs> I didn't want you to know that I have this thing that kind of makes me a little crazy if I think about it. And I'm like, gosh, now these people know their pastor's a little bit crazy. And good news is I found out they already knew, right? They already knew. And so... Uh, 
but we have that risk of like, oh, gosh, if you get too close, then I, you might see my crazy over here. And so because of that, these things become these barriers. And so if I'm going to become the friend I wish I had, if I'm going to have the kind of relationships that, that I was created to have, I've got to figure out which one of these three things is the biggest barrier. Is it the time thing? Is it the, the I, I, I don't think I have enough time, which really means I, I don't make enough time, I don't prioritize it? Is, is it the... Uh, the, the fear of being a rejected thing? Is it the I'm not willing to do the hard work to, 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 to uh, end the relationship? Is it the effort thing? Identify which one of those things it is. Because if I'm going to have these great relationships, I'm going to have to try. Here's the next thing. If, if you want to become the friend you wish you had, become a world-class encourager. If you want to become the kind of friend you wish you had, become a world-class encourager. Let me show this to you. Acts chapter 4, it's our very first introduction to this guy who becomes known as Barnabas. Let me show this to you. He's in this moment here. It's our first time we hear about him. He's giving away a bunch of money. Verse 36, thus Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas. Barnabas is just a nickname, but it becomes a nickname that sticks. His real name was Joseph. Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. What if you had a nickname that stuck with you that was based on what those that are closest to you think about your character? Like, what would that look like? <laughs> I'd give Herb a chance to speak, but <laughs> we've already had a profanity uttered in one of the messages at Life Church in the last 30 days, and so <laughs> we've already met our quota. And so uh, um, the... Uh, but what if you had a nickname that stuck with you, that was what, what the people closest to you thought of you when, when, they, when they think about you? For Barnabas, it was, man, that guy's such an encourager. Everyone just started calling him son of encouragement. And when I think about encouragement, I think it's more than just saying nice things to people. That's part of it. I think sometimes that can begin to feel like flattery. I think real encouragement is a commitment to bringing out the best in those around you. That the people in your life are better because they know you. And, and so if you're going to have the relationships you were created to have, uh, you're going to become a world-class encourager. I guarantee that those life-giving friends in your life, the people you love to be around, are the people that make you better, that, are, that actually make you the better person that you were created to be. A couple of things about Barnabas, and I think that is common in encouragers. If you want to bring out the best in people, you've got to be willing to invite include and initiate. That's what we see Barnabas doing all the time. We see it over here in Acts chapter 11. A lot of people, well, here's what a lot of people do. A lot of adults in their relationships act like they're at a seventh grade dance, right? <laughs> Waiting for everyone else to make the first move. Oh, well, I, but no, I, I, as a pastor, people come to Life Church and, and people honestly say, they'll say, hey, I was at such and such church and, and nobody ever talked to me. And nobody ever invited me to do anything. And I'll hear and I'll listen and I'll empathize. And if appropriate, I'll say, well, did you ever talk to anybody there? Did you ever talk to anybody? Did you ever invite anybody to do anything? And I can't tell you how many times it's like they never thought of it. It's like, man, I just thought everybody would come to me. But what we see in Barnabas is he has this pattern of initiating. He has this patter, pattern of including, this pattern of inviting. Let me show this to you. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 20, uh, 22, it says, The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came there, he saw the grace of God. He was glad. He exhorted them. So all, God's doing great stuff in Antioch. And then we see here in verse uh, 25, So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look. That word look literally means like he searched high and low. He didn't have a GPS coordinate. He didn't have an address. He's searching through this whole town looking for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year there, they met with the church and taught a great many people. What we see here is he initiates he includes, he goes, he finds them, he connects them to some other people. Encouragers do this. He went and found Paul. Here's the next thing. Encouragers are willing for others to get the limelight. If you're committed to bringing out the best in people, you've got to be willing for at times for it to look like they're doing better than you. You ever had a friend that looked like they wanted you to do great until you started doing better than them? You ever had a friend like that? Well, here's what we see with the story of, 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 of uh, Barnabas and Saul. 
is that in the first half of the book of Acts, whenever you see these two guys, it looks like Barnabas is like Batman and Paul is like Robin, right? It's always like, it's always Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas is taking the lead and Saul is following. But this shift happens uh, about halfway through where you see this shift where now Paul becomes Batman and Barnabas becomes Robin. Where now it's Paul and Barnabas whenever you read it. He is the primary. And, and so if you're committed to bringing out the best in people, you will rejoice when they're doing awesome, even if it looks like they're doing a little more awesome than you. But see, here's the thing. Encouragement is necessary. We all need it. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Here's what it's saying. It says, Let us give thought to how we can bring out the best in each other. It says, Not neglecting to meet together. It says, Man, don't stop showing up at church. Don't stop showing up at life group. He's like, Man, we need each other. He says, that, he says Some people do that. That's the habit of some. But encouraging one another even more as you see the day approaching even more as we get closer to Jesus coming back. If you want to have more and better friends, become a world-class encourager. Be committed to bringing out out the best in people. Here's the, here's the third thing. If you want to have great friendships, invite Jesus into the friendship. If you want to have an, another level of relationships, invite Jesus into the friendship. Let me read Acts 13, verse 1. It says, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. There was Barnabas, there was Simeon, there was Lucius, there was Manian, and, and, uh, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting... So they're inviting God into everything that's going on. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then they go on this awesome missionary journey. And, and so here it is. Recognize, if it'll take your relationships to another level. If you recognize that God has a purpose, at least one, God has a purpose for every single relationship in your life. So when you consider your friendships, recognize that, that there's more than just you and me watching a ball game. There's more than just you and me chatting after work, that God is at work here. He has a purpose, and so I need to invite him into the friendship. And so maybe you're friends with someone that doesn't yet know Jesus. And maybe part of the reason that you're in their life, or part of the purpose is that as you love them well and serve them well, you can point them towards Jesus. Maybe you and, and someone else, like, man, you both love Jesus, and, and, and maybe the purpose is you're just supposed to encourage each other. God has a purpose in it. Maybe like these guys, that God has a purpose and intent to do something special through you. He wants to use you on mission, just like he did there with Paul and Barnabas. That's why it's so awesome at Life Church, these dozens of ministry teams, because it's as we serve together, these, these friendships, something special happens because God has a purpose. And so as you look at your friendships through the lens of Jesus, and you say, Jesus, what are some things you might want to do in this friendship? I inviting him to be an active participant, recognizing that he has, he has something in mind for the friendships. Invite Jesus into the friendship. Really for us, that's what life groups are all about. We've got these groups of people, you can, they're about to start back up the week of September the 9th. Uh, that we've got dozens of these groups that happen through the week. Got them in the morning and the afternoon and the evening. Got them for men, got them for ladies. Got groups that are co-ed. Uh, and, and they happen all through the week. And, and really what it is, is it's really just people just kind of intentionally coming together and, and inviting Jesus into the friendship. And sometimes it starts off with dinner or eating dessert. And then people just talk about life and talk about their week. And, and, and then talk about what's Jesus doing in our lives. And sometimes it looks like talking about the sermon. Sometimes it's, it's kind of a study of sorts. And, and, but what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to make a priority. I'm, gonna, I'm going to create time in my life because this matters. And I'm going to get with some people and invite Jesus into the friendship and talk about life, talk about Jesus, eat some food, pray for one another. And I want to encourage you. We, I think last year, last um, semester at Life Church, I think there was about 600 people in groups like these. And if you're not yet in one, a bunch of our groups are, are already f at capacity, but we've got groups that have space. And I want to encourage you to take that step. And people are always scared. They're like, well, what if I show up and the people are all weird, right? And I just want you to know, you're not trapped there. We'll help you find a group that works for you. Now, don't live in fear of one weird person. You want to find the one weird person, because if you can't find the one, it means that you're the one. And so, so you, you want to find that person. 
And, and so one is the right number. If you can't find them, be concerned. If you want to know if you are the weird person in the group, ask me. I'll let you know. I don't even have to go to your group to know. I can talk to you for two minutes and let you know. And so, uh, um, but, and so you can text uh, LC Groups to 970-00, and then you'll be sent a link uh, that, with a directory of our groups. You can sign up for groups that way. You can go after service. Out on the patio, there are some folks there with, at tables that will have sign-ups for some of the groups that are available. Um, and so I want to encourage you to do it. Our, we, Claire and I have been uh, leading and hosting the same group for a number of years. We're actually uh, kind of grown out of our house and uh, in terms of that group and, uh, and are needing more child care um, at that group. And so we're actually kind of moving our group and combining with the Bronze and some other leaders at Life Church. We're going to be kind of a mid-sized group that's happening here on Wednesday nights. Uh, that'll be a, that group can kind of get as big as it gets, and then we'll just keep adding kind of round tables that we'll have kind of smaller groups gather around those round tables, and childcare will be uh, provided. And so that's happening on Wednesday night. So if the idea of going to someone's house terrifies you, um, I understand. And so uh, that'll be happening here at the church on. Wednesday nights. Here's the fourth thing. If you're going to thrive at your relationships, recognize that, that you're uh, going to have to try. Um, become a world-class encourager. Invite Jesus into the relationship. Recognize that he has a plan and a purpose for the friendship. And then here's the fourth thing. Lavish grace. Nobody's looking for another judgmental friend. Nobody's looking for another friend that doesn't forgive them when they screw up. Nobody's looking for another friend that talks about them behind their back. Nobody's looking for another friend that, that believes the worst about them. Everybody's looking for another friend that will lavish grace. So as you fast forward in this story of, of, of Barnabas and Paul, they go on this mission trip, and they take along this guy named John Mark. They go on this mission trip, and John Mark, the whole time, he's complaining. He's complaining, oh, the food isn't very good, and man, we stayed at the Holiday Inn. Why couldn't we stay at the Sheraton? And he's like complaining the whole time. And then it gets even harder, and then he, he leaves. He bails on the mission trip, right? And, and so he, he quits when it gets hard, and they wrap up that trip, and now Paul and Barnabas are about to go on another trip. And Barnabas says, hey, let's take John Mark. And Paul's like, that guy is a weak, complaining mama's boy. We're not taking him on this trip. <laughs> and then Barnabas says, let's give him a second chance. I think he's grown up. I think he's going to do better. Let's give him a second chance. And Paul's like, no, I ain't doing it. <laughs> and then it says they got into this big disagreement where Paul's like, hey, you go take John Mark. I'm going to take someone that's not going to quit on us. But what we see in Barnabas is we see this idea of, of lavishing grace, giving the second chance, and that's, if you want to have another level of relationships in your marriage, with your kids, in your friendships, begin to lavish grace. Believe the best. Be quick to forgive. Never give up on people. See, that guy, John Mark, goes on to write the very first gospel. The gospel of Mark, it's the same guy. The guy that bailed on the mission trip halfway through. The guy that complained the whole time. And, and I, I, I believe this. I believe that Mark never ends up writing that first gospel if Barnabas doesn't say, hey, I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to lavish grace. I'm going to be quick to forgive. The thing is this, Barnabas never writes a book of the Bible. Barnabas, you know, but what happens is, is Barnabas plays this giant role in John Mark's life because he's a great friend. Barnabas plays this giant role in the Apostle Paul, who other than Jesus Christ may be the most influential human that's ever walked the planet, the Apostle Paul. But if Barnabas doesn't go out and pursue him and take a risk on him and take the time and the effort on him and encourage him and give him a shot and bring out the best in him, even when it meant that he ended up getting more of the limelight, if he doesn't do those things, I don't know that we ever see Paul become the Apostle Paul. I don't know that John Mark ever ends up writing the gospel of Mark. I, I want you to get this. Your relationships are more important than you ever realize. Your friendships are more important than you ever could possibly realize. And you just got to get this. I mean, I don't know that we see a, a better picture of friendship in the, in the Bible other than Barnabas. There's a few great pictures of friendship that we see. But there is a friend greater than Barnabas, right? And when the Bible says there's a friend that sticks closer to a brother, the ultimate friend like that is Jesus. 
the, the, the one who, who took, paid the ultimate price, gave the ultimate effort in dying in our place on the cross. The one who's the uh, ultimate encourager when it comes to bringing out the best in us. Because what he's all about is he's all about taking a whole of my brokenness and what's wrong with me and, and, and replacing it with all that's good in him. And there's no one that's ever poured out more grace than him. And he wants to be in the middle of, of your life and in the middle of all of your relationships. And, and he is the friend that sticks closer than our brother. Let me pray for you. And he is the one that will never give up on you. So, Father, we do thank you for Jesus. And God, we thank you that you created us for relationship, relationship with you and relationship with one another. And God, I pray that you'd help us just understand how important this stuff is. God, that we wouldn't see it as an afterthought, that we wouldn't see it as a luxury, but that we'd see it as vital, that would make it a priority. And God, I pray that in our relationships, you'd help us to try whether that's making the time, whether that's putting forth the effort when relationships get hard, whether that's taking the risk. God, I pray that you'd help us to be people that bring out the best in each other. I pray that Life Church would just be filled with great encouragers, people that really want to bring out your best in people's lives. Lord, I pray you'd help us just to invite you to be in the middle of all of our relationships, recognizing that you have plans and purposes for each of these friendships. God, I pray that you'd help us to lavish grace. Help us to believe the best. Help us to be quick to forgive. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. amen. One last thing. One or two last things. Um, <laughs> Go sign up for a group. You can do it through text. You can do it at the tables. Hey, listen, I, here's one more thing about relationships. Your relationships, it's been shown that not having enough good relationships, this is true stuff. This sounds like a joke. It's true. Um, and it's funny. But um, it's uh, not having enough good relationships has been shown to be harmful to your health. True story. It's been shown to be as harmful to your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So some of you were thinking about quitting smoking, and you, all you need to do is go join a life group, okay? And so... Uh, have a great week. Okay.